scholars, and I am moderating the latest in our series on American innovation. This webinar is Moore's Law and the Creation of the Transistor. Now, I'm going to give you the prompt that was given to our two distinguished speakers. Following the creation of the transistor by William Shockley, he founded a business to bring them to mass market. Shortly after, however, eight PhD graduates left Shockley Semiconductor to found Fairchild Semiconductor, which became an incubator for many of the biggest names in Silicon Valley. From Intel to AMD, numerous companies got their start either directly or indirectly from Fairchild Semiconductor. How was the transistor originally developed? Who were some of the key players at Fairchild? How did they develop and improve on the transistor? What is Moore's Law? And how did it help to shape the digital age? Now, our two distinguished speakers are uh, Dr. Ross Bassett, who is a professor of history at North Carolina State University, distinguished resume, which I'm not giving you all of, but author of several books, including To the Digital Age, Research Labs, Startup Companies, and the Rise of MOS Technology. Dr. Arnold Thackeray is the former president of the Chemical Heritage Foundation and founding chairman of the Department of History and Sociology of Science of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, among his many publications are Moore's Law, The Life of Gordon Moore, Silicon Valley's Quiet Revolutionary. Now, as I say, they are very distinguished and I'm not giving you everything. What I will be doing is, as I put it into chat, is a list of, or Q&A in this case, uh, no, chat, excuse me, uh, their books at Amazon. I am doing this partly so that you go to Amazon and buy their books. Um, uh, so let's, or I've sent that to host and panelists. I don't know if that's uh, visible to everyone. I hope if it's not, Chance, please make it visible. Send this to everyone. Well, uh, no. the, the point of this, however, is also... Uh, when you do your questions, which will come after each of the speakers does a 12 to 14 minute uh, talk, uh, a little loose, they're allowed to go along, um, there will be the question and answer. You, the audience, should put your questions into either the chat or Q&A buttons at the bottom. They can then be, well, read by the uh, panelists who can also talk to each other, or I will convey them to uh, the, the panelists um, so they uh, it be easily heard. If we don't get to your question done in whatever conversational order seems good, do not panic. Send email to me afterwards, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L -L at nas.org, and I will be delighted to convey your questions to our panelists so that they can have the option to respond to you. So no question ever gets wasted. Um, do not worry if you have to leave this uh, panel partway through. Within 24 hours, it will be on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel and there in perpetuity. So you will always be able to see this, even if you have to leave. Having said all that, um, I'm going to ask if I might first, Dr. Thackeray, would you be so kind as to speak uh, the first time? Okay, uh, somewhere I hope my slides are visible, is that true? I can't see them. <laughs> no, we will need to repeat that same process. So uh, go down the bottom of your screen, select, select share screen from your, your Zoom window. All right. And um, yeah, all right. Maybe they come up, I click on something. Sure. Oh, the wonders of science. Now then I should there be able they to. They are. Yeah. Okay, oh, come on, go backwards. Why won't it go backwards for me? Help. Click the back arrow. Uh, click on the slide. Just click on it real fast. And now, now oh, use back forward. and forward. That's gone way forward. So now you can use your back arrow. All right. right. Away we go. So technology, the application of conceptual knowledge for achieving practical goals in a reproducible way. History, 
a series of events of which the story has been or might be told. Uh, put them together in the case of computing, put them together in the case of anything, you get a story of ever-increasing acceleration. And that is what this is all about, ever-increasing acceleration. If you want the big picture, going back 5,000 years, you can see how 3,000 years ago we get things we can still see, the pyramids and Stonehenge. Change is rather slow. You can see it's moving up by 1750, where we're, we're really moving. The steam engines are stationary. The longitude at sea is essential to creating the British Empire. And uh, cotton mills, for instance, in Lancashire, uh, produce essentially the American South. Um, by the 19th century, things are really bubbling. Uh, the steam engine has got wheels and is roaring down the tracks. Steamships are sailing everywhere. Electric current is lighting up the world. Factories, population. By 1890, the US census shows 63 million. Uh, the population has grown by 25% in the previous 10 years. People are moving and grooving. Uh, and if you're going to do a census with 63 million people, it's no good just having a piece of paper and a pencil. Enter Mr. Hollerith and Mr. Burroughs and tabulation and computation. And since then, of course, we've had booming world population, ever more types of stuff, and much more of it. Stuff, 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 stuff. Visit your local Walmart, Walmart. you'll need a storage center of your own very soon. Uh, tabulating, communicating, researching is the name of the game in the computer age, which we might define as stretching from the first appearance of international business machines to artificial intelligence today. Uh, AT&T has the monopoly on the American phone service. What's not to like? Money galore. The trade-off is we'll set up a basic research arm to kind of think about everything on behalf of the American people. Bell Labs, 1925. We're into the age of thermionic valves, vacuum tubes. You see some on the left. They are equal, each equals one individual transistor in due course. You can see they're rather big. And you can see production taking off from a million units in 1921 to 100 million units in 1939. Uh, and of course, well, we'll put all the vacuum tubes together. We'll make a real computer, a real one. The first really working large scale computer, ENIAC at the University of Pennsylvania, 17,000 valves. It works for about three minutes, if you're lucky, before a valve gives way. And then the question, which of 17,000 gave way? Um, Bell Labs knows there must be an answer in solid, better answer in solid state physics. And in 1947, the germanium transistor is struggled on, struggled into. The key guy here, we're dealing, this, this whole thing is a story of trends. It's also a story of two individuals. Number one, William Shockley, brilliant, and in the end, quite crazy, uh, much too much close to his mother. Uh, miraculously, he, he grows up on the West Coast in a little place no one's never heard of, ever heard of, Palo Alto. Where on earth is that? Well, it's in the Valley of Heart's Delight, in the middle of all the fruit orchards that stretch for miles. But he's there, so he becomes a bachelor. He's, he's ambitious, he's highly capable. He gets his bachelor's degree from Caltech, and then, gee, you better go east where things are really happening. An MIT PhD, uh, Bell Labs, that's where the action is, solid state physics, um, he's really uh, the sort of man who thinks he can do everything and anything, and boy, he's in charge. So in July 46, the war office is asking him, oh, if we invade Japan, how many people are, we, are going to be killed? And he works it out. Them. The answer is uh, four to ten million Japanese, uh, around a million Americans. What's not to like? The answer is we don't like it. We'll drop the atomic bomb and thereby demonstrate to the world that science and technology is where it's at. 
and solid state physics and Bell Labs and this slightly crazy, brilliant man. And here you can see vacuum tubes being replaced by transistors in 1954, that uh, it's a 300 to one ratio in favor of vacuum tubes. By 1957, it's clear that transistors are going to be where the money is. But, and shockly, um, here's transistor production, and because the second change is, oh, silicon, not germanium, is the solid state thing you work, want. In 1954, a uh, million three germanium, 20,000 silicon in 1957, uh, 27,000 germanium, but a million uh, silicon and silicon much higher uh, value, much better thing to have. Uh, and boy, there's a demand for this stuff. So people are leaving Bell Labs like crazy research scientists off to the races. The idea of startup companies exists, so why don't we do it? Shockley, uh, you know, he's, he's doing very nicely. He gets a Nobel Prize in 1956. That's not bad. He's only 46. Uh, but he's late to this party, and he finally, the light bulb goes off. Oh, why aren't I making a fortune? I'm stuck here in New Jersey. Why aren't I making a fortune? Uh, he was a Caltech graduate. Arnold Beckman, uh, 20 years earlier, had made his fortune out of vacuum tubes. He was a Caltech chemist who became, in the form of time, the board chair. Oh, he'll invest in Scott Shockley. He understands. And Shockley, his crazy mother is still in Palo Alto. Shockley says, do you mind, I know all the actions on the East Coast, but do you mind if we do this in Palo Alto? I want to be close to my mother. Um, uh, Beckman says yes, and you can see state of the art. It's a plum drying shed to make prunes to go east uh, that's vacant, and that becomes Shockley Semiconductor. He's smart, he's multi talented, he's, he, he wants to recruit young PhDs. He knows everybody who's anybody and is asking them about who do you know who might be promising. He's making telephone calls. And in February 1956, in the evening, he makes one of those rare long-distance calls, uh, all of which start, this is shocking, because if you don't know who I am, you can't be born. Uh, who was he calling? A very different individual, totally different individual, Gordon Moore, the local boy in that area. Gordon's great-grandfather, the first settler in Pescadero, in the... the coastal side of the mountains down the edge of the San Francisco Bay, go over them to get to the coast. Uh, it's Redwood Forest. It's only 33 miles from Palo Alto. And it's the one town in California that you can confidently say has less population today than it did in 1900, because it's in the middle of nowhere. And who wants to live in the middle of nowhere? almost impossible to get out because of the mountains, the roads, and all of that. But here's Gordon Moore's grandfather and his the five sons of the founder, uh, the second from the left, Walter Henry Moore, and you can see they've become standard Western desperados. You're in the middle of nowhere, doing nothing, keep yourself to yourself. Uh, you're a man, aren't you? Keep your emotions inside and just get on with what you have to do. Chop down those redwood trees and get on with it. No worries. So uh, Gordon's father has some difficulty of getting going, uh, but eventually he lands a job as the constable on horseback, part-time, going all the way from the San, uh, uh, from the Santa, it should say San Jose, I'm sorry, the San Jose, border to San Francisco during prohibition. Stop the smuggling, stop the distilling, do it all part-time on and ride your horse on. Well, it's a job, but gee. And Gordon is born just in time in 1929 uh, for the Depression. 20% uh, of the California population on relief. Uh, you know, just get on with it. Eat your wheaties and be quiet and get on with it. Uh, 
when Gordon's ten, Walter Harold moves to the thriving town of Redwood City on the shore of the bay as a deputy sheriff. So this strange young man is in a different place. A two-bedroom, one-bathroom house. Wow, you know, luxury. This is where Gordon's parents live out the rest of their life. This is where he grows up to the age of 18. Um, and he's there. Uh, there's a better high school uh, local. There's, there's 12,000 people in Redwood City. Big city, gosh. Um, Gordon, you know, how do you express your emotion? Oh, chemistry. Uh, mail order TNT. What more could you want? So he's making bombs and bangs and doing his thing. The man on a single track, quite the opposite of Shockley. And this goes to technology and the different types of people. Um, he's the first in his family to go to uh, college. Uh, and again, it should say San, San Jose, I apologize. Uh, and after two years, he's commuting by railroad daily from home to San Jose uh, and loving it, the chemistry. He transfers to Berkeley, actually goes to live over there at the age of 20, leaves the Redwoods behind. Um, and by 1950, he's graduating. He's clear now, oh, I want to do chemistry. You know, I just want to be in the lab by myself and do chemistry. And I can always make a bang when I'm fed up. And uh, his girlfriend, local girlfriend, is a little dis, uh, put off when he says, oh, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to Caltech. And so what about me? Oh, well, we should get married. So pronto, wedding organized on a Saturday in September. And then they're off driving down to Caltech uh, in Southern California, because on Monday morning, he's got to take his exams to kind of get going as a student. All right, he's brilliant. He loves it. His PhD in physical chemistry, no time. He wants to be an academic, you know, get a nice research position in his own lab. But there are no academic jobs. This is the baby dirt. Nobody was wanting children in the 1930s. Nobody is wanting professors in the 1950s. And California is a desert, a desert as far as science PhDs and jobs. Defaults, defaults to Washington, D.C., the applied physics lab, uh, making missiles and things for the Navy. What's not to like? The job is lovely, but Washington, D.C., oh, this is not uh, Redwood City. This is not Pescadero. Um, there's the discrimination. There's the climate, which is horrible. He's restless. Then one evening, the phone rings. This is Shockley. The rest of the story is history. Uh, he goes to Shockley. Uh, he's, he goes to Fairchild. And then he goes to Intel, where he is for 30 years. And um, is this, he is the driver of the research because he's found something he can drive. Uh, and he's doing it essentially from the 40 years, just driving the research. What is the research? Well, it's Moore's law. He, you're making transistors. You're making solid state versions of electronic valves. And um, he's a physical chemist. It's electricity that goes around the circuit, make the circuit smaller, less distance to go. The whole thing is faster. It's also, if it's smaller, you get more out of the same amount of material. So this is easy, smaller, faster, cheaper. And that's Moore's law, which he um, articulates. Uh, it is, you can do it as a straight line. Uh, what you can do sort of doubles every uh, 18 months or so, or you can do it as an exponential over time. And the top graph here has components per integrated circuit, because you make them into circuits on the chip as you get smarter. That is, transistors become the essential element in things called chips. Um, and you can see in 1958, uh, you're um, getting nothing on a chip. You know, you've got to invent a chip to put the transistors together on the silicon and then 
carve it out as one thing. And by uh, the mid-1970, uh, the optimum thing is to get 65,000 transistors on a chip, and it will be cheaper. Uh, the first transistors, the first order, each individual transistor the size of your uh, thumbnail, they were wanted by the U.S. Department of Defense. That's the name of the game in the 50s and 60s. Uh, they wanted it for the atomic aeroplane. Now, some of you may not have uh, ridden in an atomic aeroplane. Uh, incidentally, if you have ridden in an atomic aeroplane, you're crazy because there was never any such thing. But it was to be the American answer to Sputnik because the thing about Sputnik, it wasn't that it went round the Earth. The Defense Department was terrified. It showed the Russians, they, they launched Sputnik with the rocket they designed to put an H-bomb on New York. And Sputnik showed it worked. And we had no answer, hence crash program in the late 1950s for the atomic aeroplane, hence the first order uh, to uh, um, uh, Fairchild, uh, I'm sorry, to um, Shockley for, um, gee, you know, you're trying to make an aeroplane, you're trying to make a rocket or an aeroplane, you're trying to put an electronic valve, the things that used to be in old fashioned radios in there. It doesn't do well when you shake the whole thing vigorously. They desperately, they want an atomic aeroplane powered by transistors. That never happened, but it did kind of keep Shockley afloat. Here's another version of Moore's Law, components per chip. And you can see again by 1980, you're thinking of a million transistors on one chip, not one transistor, but a million. And Moore has understood, gee, smaller, faster, cheaper, doubling, what's not to like. And so he's at, at Intel, um, and he drives it. He just drives it. Uh, he's a man of few words. He's a man of focused interest. Uh, but he has in Andy Grove the one essential requirement, somebody who can execute, somebody who can run a company. And Andy Grove said to me in an interview, if I have succeeded better than others have, it is because I was better at reading Gordon Moore's facial expressions. Because Moore never made a fuss, he never said anything particular. But you could tell what he liked and what he didn't like if you read his facial expressions. So, 1995, 30th anniversary, uh, 70 million billion transistors have been made by then. That's about 600,000 for every human who ever lived. Uh, uh, by then, one microchip might include around 15 million transistors in complex three-dimensional patterns. I mean, this is Intel. This is driving. Uh, compared with that, a Boeing 747 is simplicity itself with only 6, 000, 6 million parts. Um, so Gordon Moore drives Intel until he's no longer wanted. By then, he's the richest man in California. He's the most philanthropic man in California. Uh, in the coinage of 2000 AD, he's worth 25 billion or so. Or, and he, the most philanthropic man, he's one of the very few individuals on the face of the earth who have given away more than half of what he uh, made during his lifetime and all the rest of it. He died uh, last year at the age of 94. All the rest goes to charity because it's simple. You know, you do something you can do and money is only money. So there we are, what's the problem? So there's two types of people developing the computer age. Shockley, um, never got anywhere with Shockley Semiconductor, it collapsed. Uh, he uh, was, since he had a Nobel Prize, Stanford made the mistake of making him a uh, distinguished professor. And so he was free to uh, push loudly 
his uh, genetic theories, which said that, quite obviously, all blacks are inferior. Uh, that, of course, was scarcely the statement that anybody wanted to hear. Uh, so two individuals in the mix, uh, the rush of technology, and um, some people will say we're only just getting started. So uh, fasten your seatbelts, enjoy the computer age. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, and let's say we okay yes we have the sh sharing off. Thank you so much. And now I'd go to uh, Dr. Bassett. Would you be so kind as to give the second talk? Sure. Let me just. Uh, about this. So you're also trying to get a screen sharing going? Yeah, I just, um, it's, I, I've got it now. And you can see my screen now? Yes. Thank you, everyone. I'm I'm delighted to be here and to to follow um, Dr. Thackeray and his talk. So I want to um, and we didn't we plan Arnold and I talked a little bit, but I think our our talks mix well together and look at different aspects of this of this phenomenon known as Moore's law. That in my talk, I'd like to focus on Moore's law as capitalism and look at specifically uh, institutions and supply and demand. And so one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to sometimes, uh, rather than say Moore's Law, I'm going to talk about the phenomenon described by Gordon Moore in his 1965 paper. And by doing that, as a, as a historian, I like to recognize the fact that Moore's Law didn't really exist as a law until maybe the late 1970s or 1980s. Um, uh, Arnold mentioned that Carver Mead played a big role in um, uh, pronouncing uh, what Gordon Moore had written in 1965 as Moore's Law, but for a long time it wasn't really that. It was just a paper that he had written. And so, again, what I would say is that Moore's Law is really, at its essence, is about capitalism. And to be more specific, what I might say is that Moore's Law is a vision of a possible future that has been realized over the last 58 years by the mobilization of an ever increasing group of companies that stood to profit from that future. So again, Moore's law wasn't inevitable. It's not a law of science, but it's something that um, corporations have seen the possibilities of profit in. So I wanna, uh, again, with Arnold, go back to the invention of the transistor in 1947 uh, by Bell Labs. Um, You'll see um, William Shockley at the micro at the microscope there, and then John Bardeen on the left, and w Walter Bratton at the right. And so Bell Labs was looking for a way to replace vacuum tubes. And so in doing so, they found they invented the transistor. And at the time, this wasn't seen as a profoundly revolutionary device. That it had a it was announced and got very little attention in the New York Times. It was um, uh, given a small blurb in, a, in the back page about, about radio news. And one of the contradictions you might say about the transistor, looking at it in retrospect, the transistor was ultimately a, a radical device, a revolutionary device. It was invented by a conservative organization that Bell had a monopoly over telephone service. Um, they believed that telephone equipment should have a 30-year lifespan. So you know, if you had bought a, a phone in um, in 1993, your phone would be eligible now for an, an upgrade. Uh, one of the things that Bell did, though, was they essentially released the transistor into the wild. They had a patent on it, but they said anyone could make these devices if they paid a license fee of $25,000. And in fact, Bell would teach you how to, to make these devices. As Arnold had, men had mentioned in 1956, uh, 
William Shockley left to form Shockley Semiconductor. And in 1957, the traitorous eight, a group of scientists left Shockley to form Fairchild. And in 1959, uh, Robert Noyce, who's uh, the closest to us in the this group, um, invented the integrated circuit. And so the advantage that the integrated circuit had over traditional ways of building computers, electronics was. Um, and so on the top right, you see a, a conventional way that one would make electronic components before the integrated circuit. One would have a circuit card and one would put individual resistors, capacitors, transistors all together. And then with an assembly of these, one would have whatever you wanted, a computer or, or, or whatever. Uh, Robert Noyce's integrated circuit on the bottom right uh, combined all of these elements on a single piece of silicon. So this had the advantage of, of being smaller. Uh, it had the advantage of avoiding a lot of reliability problems that would come with this. But at the time in 1959, when the in integrated circuit was conceived, it was in fact a fairly controversial invention. There were people who didn't believe it would ever work. Um, not coincidentally, a lot of these people were at Bell Labs, that they, Bell Labs were not believers uh, in the integrated circuit. And you could say, in some sense, the transistor was invented on the East Coast and it found a home on the West Coast. Um, in Gordon Moore at Fairchild was the head of research and development. And in 1965, Electronics Magazine, sort of the leading trade magazine in the field uh, for its 50th anniversary issue, asked him to write an article about the future of integrated circuits and the future of electronics. And so he wrote this article that came to be seen as the or point of origin of Moore's law. And so the graph that, again, came to be seen as the origin of Moore's law was an analysis that Moore made of costs. And so basically to summarize what he did is he said that at any point in time for making integrated circuits, there was a sweet spot, a good operating point to be at, which resulted in um, the cheapest uh, cost per component. And that sweet spot had been moving out by a factor of two every year. And so again, um, and so he had relatively uh, a small amount of data to, to base this analysis on. So, and, and so again, in, 19, um, in 1959, you could put um, two um, transistors or two components on integrated circuit by 1964 uh, and so on. And so he extrapolated this out to 1975, which suggested that you could put 65,000 uh, components on an integrated circuit. And so uh, one of the illustrations of this in this article uh, is shown here. And in the article, Moore said, integrated circuits will lead to such wonders as home computers, which seemed a bit far-fetched, I think, at the time that uh, computers were things that cost millions of dollars. It took entire rooms. And so here you have sort of a whimsical uh, image suggesting that we would be selling home computers alongside notions and, and cosmetics uh, computers would be as small as you, uh, you could um, hold on your hand. Uh, I want to just go back to this this chart uh, that M Gordon Moore made. One of the things I mean, so this is, you know, this diagram is very nice and clean. But if you were in the industry, you would sort of, I think, realize some challenges that this posed. Uh, the issue is that you need to make money at every everything that you're making. Every point on this curve has to ultimately represent a product that you can sell for money. And so it's not exactly, it's not at all clear what you're going to do at each point along the line. What product can you make that people will actually want to buy? So, you know, in the long future, you know, if you could make a integrated circuit that would uh, encompass an entire computer, sure. But how do you... Uh, partition a computer into components that you can actually make money from. And in some sense, um, that was the big challenge. And so another aspect of this is just thinking about uh, the Model T and comparing the Model T with integrated circuits. So with the Model T, Henry Ford had one model that he made, one product that he made for 19 years. He made 15 million Model Ts. 
Um, so what Gordon Moore's 1965 paper implied that in the electronics industry, you have to continue, continually move. You have to produce basically more or less a new product every year. And so that requires two things. You have to develop the technology to do that, but you also have to find new products, find products that are compatible with that growth, com products that will allow for, for continual growth. And so one example of, of this problem so um, those of us who are of a certain age sort of remember the joy of the when uh, pocket calculators first came out. And so uh, pocket calculators were made possible by integrated circuits. But at the same time, you could say that the phenomena of Gordon Moore's 1965 paper destroyed the pocket calculator market as a really profitable area line of business to be in because it became these um, pocket calculators, the integrated circuits became so cheap that you couldn't make any money out of it. And there was really no growth path, no growth path to going from a, a four function calculator uh, to there weren't really products that would have a, a significant demand. It was sort of too early to think about personal computers or anything like that. So you had this basically product that was a dead end. As Arnold mentioned in 1968, uh, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore left Fairchild to, to form Intel. And in interviews that I've done, and um, sometimes they talk about some, some slights, some problems that they had with Fairchild, but I think looking at it in retrospectively, I guess what I would say is that I think Gordon Moore and probably Robert Noyce understood that this 1965 paper the realization of this 1965 paper required a different organization than what Fairchild had. It needed a new corporate culture. It needed a new structure. Um, quite remarkably, um, Intel had no research and development lab that they had seen, Gordon Moore had seen as the head of research and development, that it took a lot of time to get products from research into manufacturing. That in some sense was incompatible with Moore's law, you could say that you don't have time as if you're going to be doubling the density of your the components on an integrated circuit, you don't have time to be wasting um, years sort of fighting between research and development and manufacturing. Another way that Intel operated was what, what Robert Noyce called the principle of least information. And what this meant was that Intel, if they had a, a problem, they would not do research on this sort of internally seeking to find a publishable solution, seeking to find something that they could publish in a journal. No, they would do research just to the point where it solved the problem, and then they would move on. They weren't going to produce excess information, uh, again, based on the principle of, Moore, of Moore's 1965 paper. Sort of as Arnold also uh, alluded to, that in some sense you could say, there was a human incarnation of Moore's law. And ironically enough, that wasn't Gordon Moore, uh, who was in some sense a professorial type. The human incarnation of Moore's law was Andy Grove. He was the third man at Intel uh, and was known for his hyper aggressiveness. And you could see in some sense a hyper aggressive capital, capitalism at Intel. He was famous for his slogan, only the paranoid survive. Uh, Andy Grove was the one who told everyone you can't leave early on Christmas Eve. You've got to stay your normal work day. Uh, Andy Grove had seminars on the Intel culture for new Intel employees. And at one point he asked the, the students, uh, what is the Intel way? And an eager Intel, new Intel employee said, well, the Intel way is you don't uh, wait for someone to give you the ball. You pick it up yourself and you run with it. And Andy Grove said, no, that's not the Intel way. The Intel way is you take the football, you deflate it and you stick it inside your shirt. You grab another football. Then you run past the goal line. You reinflate the football inside your shirt and you um, have now scored two touchdowns instead of one. And so in some sense, it was that aggressiveness um, that really is fundamental to Moore's 1965 paper. But so again, Intel had the problem of finding a product that they could sell. They weren't just, they couldn't just sell the graph of Moore's law. They had to find some, some product that people would pay money for. And so it happened that by the time Intel was founded, this 
graph had moved, um, the uh, progress in electronics had moved far enough that it was possible to produce a, a semiconductor memory. Up until this time, uh, memories had been made based on magnetic cores. And so by uh, the early 1970s, Intel made uh, the 1103, which was a 1000 bit memory product um, that was cheaper than cores. And so one of the advantages of this ha this product had was it was possible to go from 1000 bits to 4000 bits to 16,000 bits uh, and computer companies could use these products. So it was a, a Moore's law type product. Uh, another product that Intel introduced, of course, was the microprocessor in 1971. And one of the remarkable things about the microprocessor at that time, and there are some people who don't consider the microprocessor really an invention. They thought, you know, everyone knew that it was possible. But at the time, what Intel introduced was a processor that was capable of uh, manipulating four bits of information at a time. And so this wasn't actually enough to to form a computer. And so in some sense, Intel had to really beat around the bush, uh, again, seeking demand, seeking people who could find some use for this. And so that was one of the, their big challenges, finding demand uh, for this. And so they had to find new customers, uh, sometimes customers who were, weren't really very well known for odd sorts of things, for uh, controlling elevators or controlling uh, traffic lights or things like that. But ironically, you could say that one of the, the great things about the microprocessor as it existed was, in some sense, because it was so poor, it was so weak, it was a Moore's Law product because there was a growth path for it. You could go from 4 bits to 8 bits to 16 bits to 32 bits to 64 bits. And so you could push along um, that way. And so that was um, key. And so here's just a graph of... Uh, of progress in um, microprocessors. But again, the issue of demand was always there uh, in the 19, and in some sense, one of the ways I would think about Moore's law is that from uh, 1965 till maybe the late 1990s, in some sense, one of the big challenges of Moore's law was the problem of demand. And so in the, in the 1990s, in the pre-internet era, uh, personal computer companies weren't always convinced that you needed to have more and more powerful microprocessors. They weren't convinced that users, consumers needed them. There weren't applications that needed them. And so Intel you know, saw that as a threat. And so one of the things that they did was they worked to find new applications that would use this computer power. So one of the things that is they worked with Microsoft to develop video applications. Uh, another thing they did is, so when some computer company said, oh, we're not going to introduce this new Intel line of microprocessors. We don't think people need them. Uh, one of the things that Intel did was they produced sort of all the peripheral equipment so that anyone could just go out there and start making um, personal computers with Intel's latest microprocessors. So if um, a company like Hewlett Packard or at the time Compaq said, oh, we don't want to make computers with Intel's latest processors, well, somebody else could. Intel needed to find a way to, again, keep this demand going. I want to uh, just talk uh, briefly about sort of the supply side of Moore's Law, and that was uh, industry-wide collaboration. And so one of the things that the industry did to keep Moore's Law going, to be able to continue to produce integrated circuits with these ever increasing capacities was the industry worked together to produce roadmaps to uh, sort of planning what innovations are necessary to keep this going. And so in 2003, there was an international roadmap to say, what do we need to do to make the next generation of uh, semiconductors? And so they examined a wide variety of areas. I wanna uh, just uh, mention in closing, thinking about Moore's law, at 58, uh, one aspect of Moore's law is diffusion. You could say that Moore's law, the DNA of Moore's law has spread throughout our society. Computer companies, software companies, equipment manufacturers, uh, in, even individuals. We expect Apple to introduce you know, a new iPhone every year that would be more powerful. Uh, Chat GPT uh, is a manifestation of Moore's law, you could say, and we expect you know, Chat GPT will improve over time. So we. Moore's law has spread throughout our society. Uh, but another aspect of it is, is concentration. Each generation of 
new semiconductors has been more and more expensive to make. Um, today, there are only two firms in the world capable of making the most advanced integrated circuits, and Intel is not one of those two. There's one company in the world, uh, really uh, ASML, a Dutch company that is capable of making the most advanced lithography equipment. Um, this equipment sells for $300 million a piece. One further uh, example of this concentration is you could say that six of the 10 most valuable companies in the world today are Moore's Law's companies, that they basically owe their existence and their growth to the increase in computing power that has been made possible by Moore's Law. Thank you. And thank you so much. Uh, most wonderful. Now, I'm going to encourage everybody who is watching this, put in your questions. Uh, meanwhile, I'll have to come up with a few of my own. Um, I'm going to go back to, well, uh, Dr. Bassett, you mentioned Ford as the counterexample, but it strikes me, of course, that that is you know, the opposite. A company like General Motors is you know, having a new auto each year, ideally with some improvements. And there are, I would say, you know, lots of companies which do have you know, the, an the annual marketing and the annual actual improvement. I'm wondering here too, what other industries had the most technological, most rapid technological advance, you know, at the time that, you know, the, the Intel et al were getting off the ground? And did the transistor industry learn anything from these other companies that were having relatively rapid technological advance? Yeah. It, um, so just trying to think of some, I mean, I think of the aviation industry perhaps with, um, and so there's the, the process of learning that happens in the aviation industry that uh, making uh, airplanes m more cheaply. You have the new technology the development of uh, jet uh, jet engines at the time. Th I think of that as as a rele relevant thing. Again, but one of the differences I would say here is um, again that you're really in some sense producing new products um, that you have to find a demand for that you know airplanes or, you know, perform the same function, whether they were jets or whether they were, you know, whether they were propeller powered. But and again, GM cars performed the same function. But what um, Intel needed to do to really uh, realize the potential of Moore's 1965 paper was to find completely new products um, that um, people really weren't aware of at the time. May I add uh, something on that? Sure. Which is, um, if you look backwards in time, um, you go back, Justice Liebig in Gießen, one of the original PhDs in the 1830s, he understood the implications of chemical technology and produced a whole series of consumer products. If you stay in Germany, where all the action was before World War II, World War II, and certainly before World War I, um, chemistry, you know, Gordon Moore is in a long line of chemists. Um, and um, in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, IG Farben was the biggest chemical company in the world. Um, and um, of course, World War II destroyed it. After World War II, three pieces of it started up, and very soon the three largest chemical companies in the world, outshadowing something like a DuPont, were the three German pieces, Bayer, BASF, and, oh boy, I'm forgetting the third one. Um, and so innovation in chemical technology and what you do with it, you know, was very much the thing. If you go to the 1950s, you can see Gordon Moore over against the people at DuPont. I mean, think of nylon, think of better things for better living through chemistry. And what, after all, is the computer, but a better thing for better living through chemistry. So there's another whole line of thinking. Thank you. I'm going to go to a question from Larry. When only two companies make the most advanced semiconductors, and so much of the industry depends on semiconductors, how vulnerable is industry and its customers? I think we saw some of this during the COVID era, unquote. 
to either and both. Yeah, I think it's very true. I, I guess I think you see that's one of the rationales, I think, behind uh, President Biden's initiative to uh, increase uh, semiconductor production in the United States. So again, the two companies that I was um, referring to were Samsung and the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. So both of these not American companies. So uh, again, it's remarkable that such a, a fundamental technology as semiconductors that is so integral to every part of our life is sort of so dependent on such a few um, manufacturers. And again, as I, I mentioned, ASML, a uh, few suppliers who make this this all possible. Um, in other other ways, there was a little piece in the New Yorker just talking about how uh, a large percentage of the quartz that is used in semiconductors comes from one town in North Carolina. And so it's just a reminder of um, how narrow in some sense our, te uh, our technological base is and that we are dependent uh, on that and in some sense very vulnerable to any disruptions. I want to actually follow up on that question. How much was Moore's law always dependent upon oligopolistic uh, concentration and investment of profits to make possible that rapid an advance? Yeah, well, I guess in the fifties and sixties, you certainly could not say that the Valley of Heart's Delight was the center of oligopoly. I mean, come on, give me a break. <laughs> and, you know, in in a sense, um, I guess what and one of the things that I was interested in. So I worked at IBM in the nineteen eighties, and uh, IBM in the nineteen eighties actually. Uh, had the largest semiconductor production plant in the world in a place called East Fishkill, New York. Um, and, you know, IBM was the oligopoly. And so the story of semiconductor technology is that these large East Coast companies, uh, IBM, RCA, uh, Bell, Bell Labs, just did not have the culture to take advantage of this phenomenon and that it was in Silicon Valley where you had this fast moving culture that was able to take advantage of uh, of the possibilities of uh, Moore's law or that 1965 paper. Does that mean then that the current oligopoly is likely to have other to be have culturally inhibiting effects? Will it become sclerotic, et cetera? Has it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know that uh, if you look at the largest companies in the United States, they have a lifespan of average about 80 years. Uh, and I remind you, you all know who the largest employer in the United States was in 1900 AD. Uh, do I hear the answer? It's the Pennsylvania Railroad, flourishing mightily today. <laughs> all right. I will go to a different question then, if I may, from Arthur Damerick. Uh, Intel's decision to have innovation on the factory floor instead of a separate research division is somewhat legendary, but I've not seen more analysis on that. Did it work for Intel, but nobody else copied the approach? Does it have any lessons for us today as the U.S. tries to reinvigorate domestic manufacturing? One of the things I guess I'll say is that, you know, one of the ways it worked for Intel is that so many other companies were doing real research and were putting new ideas out there that Intel could, you know, take them and borrow them or, or run with them. So they used things that were developed by, uh, so uh, by Fairchild themselves that had come out of Fairchild's R and D lab. They used things that had come from IBM. One of the challenges today is that there are no, there are so. The R and D labs today have been so impoverished that there is not the same, you know, possibility of doing what Fairchild did, you know, taking advantage of research and development that it was done by someone else. And Dr. Thackeray, do you want to add to that? <laughs> Just a little entirely different riff on that. One of the wonderful stories of uh, Silicon Valley and of how it certainly was a place for innovation was um, a scruffy young fellow called Steve Jobs went to Gordon Moore 
and to Intel asking for investment in his um, new idea. And he and they said, you must be joking, go away. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so um, there's all sorts of um, kind of rifts on this territory. And I, I would say the advantage of this historian is, um, you know, all these things can only be understood in hindsight. So when you ask about today, I have to say, who knows? But time will tell. So a question from Jack Wasserman. Since need, consumption, needs to be created, does the future lie in new tech products or new techniques slash processes? So either or both. I can imagine an answer being yes and both, but what's your answer? I, I, I guess my sense is that there are, I mean, with the, today, it seems like there are, for me, it seemed like in the early 2000s or late 1990s, it seemed like there was this challenge of creating new uh, products, new demand. But it seems like there are we're at a point now, you know, with artificial intelligence and so on, neural networks, uh, that it's pretty clear, you know, that there is going to be a demand for increasingly powerful uh, integrated circuits. So in some sense, I, I think that the key area is on the the supply side versus versus the demand side uh you know i guess for maybe some of us i don't know if apple will be able to find new things that they can do with extra computing power for our macbooks or for our iphones but again um i think uh chat gpt and uh, the ai folks will be able to be able to sort of soak up all that additional computing power I'm just interested as a um, participant observer that our conversation so far, it has mentioned Taiwan, but it hasn't mentioned a five letter word that begins with C-H-I. <laughs> well, all right. So let us talk about Zhang Guo. Uh, what, 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 what is their challenge? What is their, what is their participation in the, um, you know, this industry, what is the challenge they present? What is the uh, predictable future at this point of China in all this? Well, I'll give you the retrodictable that China led the world in technology for at least five centuries. Uh, but we're back in the age of gunpowder, the, the printing press, the compass, all brought to you from China. So I wouldn't, uh, I would think this horse might run again. That's my uh, view upon it. Well, I, I, well, in the more recent past, I mean, when did China start manufacturing its own, uh, you know, you know, tra you know transistors, etc.? When did it start? When did it start exporting them? Well, the thing to watch is China used to send uh, people to the United States to study for a PhD, who then all stayed in the United States. Now, almost all of them go back to China because the career prospects are better. So there's a straw in a wind for you. And Dr. Bassett, do you, you have anything on this discussion? I really, I, I'm, I, uh, plead ignorance on uh, China. That's beyond my, you know, my knowledge base. So, I'll give you one tiny footnote. Uh, based on what Ross said, you can understand why China China is interested in the country that has Taiwan uh, semiconductor. You know, but, uh, worth taking over. <laughs> By the way, do, does India have a presence in this? That is, uh, you know, in transistors, semiconductors, etc. No. So I've I've done some research on India, and they had um, they had some government sponsored programs to try to develop semiconductors, and that really, you know, did not work for them. And so, and and again, one of the challenges is, you know, that. Moore's law really means that this is a, a really a moving target that you you can't you know get behind in this that you have 
if you're going to be there, you have to really jump on and get to speed very quickly. And India was not really able to do that. At this point, or there's a different question, how do you train the workforce? I mean, in fact, how much of this, is, you, we're talking about innovation in the factory, how much of this is you have to learn on the job? How much of this is that the necessary education is stuff you, you learn you know, in college and graduate school? You know, where do, how is the human, what are the human capital sources uh, and procedures uh, for, for the industry nowadays? I guess I'm not going to claim to that I know nowadays, but I think my sense is that it's very specialized. And I think that, you know, for engineers and uh, others, I think it's, you know, things that are learned on the job, that it's a different world than, uh, and it's hard. I think it, it would be hard for um, educational institutions really to keep up with them. I, I think that was true. Uh, so I have a degree in electrical engineering and worked in, in semiconductors. That was true in the 1980s. And I think it's probably even more true now that it, it ju the industry works at such a, a different uh, time constant than universities do that most of the a lot of the important training happens in um, in in, uh, in industry. Yeah, a different cheerful riff on all of that. Um, we're talking about manipulating matter, manipulating matter. And um, so chemistry is, you know, however you define it, tends to be at the center of the picture, you know, whether you go in one direction to the bio or in the other direction to the physics. Um, I don't know if it escaped your attention, but it didn't escape mine that the chairman of the Harvard chemistry department has been charged, indicted, and found guilty of privately and secretly receiving extensive funding from the Chinese to mm -hmm. go to China and to build their, if you will, a Harvard chemistry department. So, you know, the world is changing in different ways. And that's one that is interesting, has been publicized, but with very little publicity. Um, and um, again, something about Chinese intent is pretty clear if you scratch the surface. I will even mention that the NAS has actually uh, paid some attention to this issue. Um, I'm going to shift uh, since, since I'm uh, I'm still I think at this point not seeing other questions. I'm going to ask you know, more in mind. So the industry is something about manufacturing machines to build machines. How much of the story is, of this industry? We, 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 as we talked about the product, you know, the the doubling of you know you know the transistors each year, but. Um, how much is the story is the story of building yet more advanced machines to build these? What is necessary for that? And how and at this point, in fact, do you need extraordinarily advanced transistors to build the most advanced transistors as a sort of a happy cycle? I'm not sure so sure of that. I mean, I think you need uh, I, I mean, I don't think you need the the, you know, you need significant computing power. I don't think it, it, it's a completely sort of uh, cyclical process like that. But I think obviously uh, computing power plays an important role in everything. Um, I, I think it, it it's not irrelevant, but I, I don't think it's quite that way. And I, I don't I'm not completely up to speed about the develop. I mean, there's a lot of uh, subsidiary skills in, um, you know, uh, optics and other sorts of things that are um and of course uh, as Ar arnold has made clear to us in chemistry that are, they're involved um uh... there's a there's a, um again a different riff on that we haven't talked at all about um biomedicine but if you're wanting to um talk about complexity, of course, it's inside the human body. And it's interesting already that you cannot become the uh, 
the star medical researcher, unless you spent, uh, you know, the ages from five to 30 um, preparing for that role. But we haven't really yet begun to, to mesh that frontier really fruitfully, am amazingly, with um, the man-made world. Did either of you want to follow this or otherwise, or otherwise I'll shift to yet another new question. Um, global resource demand. When did the size of the entire, you know, you know, transistor microchip industry become so large that it placed appreciable demands on energy production, on, you know, rare earths and so on. Uh, and what are, are there global limitations of supply that currently affect the industry? Arnold, I might uh, pass that one over to you since uh, you can talk because of your background uh, with the uh, Chemical Heritage Foundation. Well, what I would say to all of you is um, atomic explosions, hydrogen bombs have been made, but to all practical per intent, matter is neither created nor destroyed. Uh, we simply move around the atoms and molecules in the world. So if you're worried about the end of supply of atoms and molecules, don't. <laughs> you know, that it's, uh, it's the way that the problem is with our society. We've got to keep you watching so that you can hear from the advertisers. And it is catastrophe. You know, forthcoming catastrophe that keeps you watching. Um, and so our world is deeply, our modern world is deeply committed to catastrophe. It's just a little in su short supply when it comes to the point. Well, all right, well, actually, let me just push you on this. You were mentioning China earlier. I mentioned rare earths. You know, one of the things people talk about is say China getting a rare earth monopoly. Are there you know, such strategic monopolies that might inhibit the uh, smooth functioning of the industry? Well, yes, there are plenty of examples in the past of that, but on the whole, they never stop anything because number one, the person who announces I know where all the world supply of anything is should be escorted to the lunatic asylum. Uh, what, what is in most of the world, we don't know. Um, how much prospecting have you done in the African jungle? <laughs> you know? And if we find something valuable, we tend to stop looking and um, exploit it. And if something's in shortage, we invent something else. You know, the World War II, Japan took over Malaysia. End of rubber. Rubber, essential for where the rubber hits the road. Well, invent synthetic rubber. No, I, I, I think catastrophes are something human beings like, but they're not necessarily. Um, and they do stir up the kind of local local events, if you will, but on a, on a world scale, it's all um, trivial noise. All right. Um, I will go to a question from Larry then. If implementation of AI depends on computing power, does that imply that AI will also develop in some way according to its own version of Moore's law? I think that's true. And I think that's uh, been the case with um, neural networks and some of these uh, similar technologies that they are, um, they are dependent on uh, the development of um, now, in the case, uh, especially uh, NVIDIA graphics chips uh, that are um, especially capable of doing this sort of machine learning type of type of work. Uh, and so some of these technologies were kind of poo pooed. And I guess maybe people, it, it, again, didn't necessarily understand the possibilities of Moore's Law. Some of these technologies were poo pooed in the 1980s. 
and 1990s, and sort of as Moore's law has come to sort of full fruition, uh, it has made these uh, artificial intelligence uh, technologies much more powerful and much more viable. And uh, Dr. Thackeray, did you want to add to that? Uh, I'll pass on that. Um, all right, so is it ever going to end? Or, no, I mean, you know, there's people have been asking this since, you know, what, since it was, you know, it was founded. Sure, it's working for now, but will, can this really keep on going? Do you think that Moore's Law is going to keep on going, you know, ad infinitum? Do you think there's some natural point at which point the curve is going to bend downwards? I think that particular curve, that particular set of realities will bend downwards. But as things like AI uh, already demonstrate, you get to a whole new uh, arena of possibilities. And um, it's not clear that our actual computing power is what um, limits innovation. But if you want to look to the long, long term, uh, I would point out to you what is going to end it all. And so far, there's no cure in sight, which is in every advanced country in the world, the birth rate is below the replacement rate. And in every country in the world, the birth rate drops as prosperity increases. And if you measure in uh, 10 year intervals, the prosperity of the world increases. We do have a production machine for, you know, for producing more, but the only thing we shall lack, the world ends when the last person switches out the lights and that's already written in the stone. So if you want something to worry about, worry about that one. Dr. Bassett. Yeah, I, I mean, I one of the things is again that Moore's law being about capitalism, I mean, it does raise the possibility. I mean, if it becomes more expensive to produce more and more uh, denser and denser uh, integrated circuits, then uh, people will, you know, companies will find other other ways to increase computing power. So I think it certainly is possible uh, that the phenomena that we know as Moore's law could end, but one could still have uh, continual increases in computing power. Thank you. And going, Dr. Thackeray's comments, in fact, actually went back to one of the early questions from Dave Peterson. Is there a possible sinister side? Which I might rephrase, are human beings built to deal with a world, you know, founded on, you know, you know the, the doubling of, you know, transistors every year? Is this, in effect, is this beyond human capacity to deal with, even if we we can create it? And this is obviously the philosophical, the cultural, but you're just tossing it out there. Yes, I, I certainly don't have an answer to that. But what I deeply love, it may be the same in the area where you live. Um, Walmart is our biggest uh, retailer of stuff in the country and therefore, I assume, in the world. You know, stuff. That's what we all go out and buy, the biggest retailer of stuff. Um, my Walmart recently opened a new store in my area in a piece of the countryside relatively unpopulated, and immediately around it were three examples of what has been the best investment of the last decade, which I hope you made, and it's not in um, Apple or whoever else you like, storage centers, public storage, because you buy more stuff, but you can't actually cope with it, but you love buying stuff, so you store it. That is the story of our civilization today. <laughs> and I haven't yet heard the political party saying we must all produce less stuff. That's for the science fiction stories of a certain brand. And Dr. Bassett, did you want to add? Um, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, all the concerns about social media sort of raised that that question. If this technology is making 
modes of interaction possible that are maybe not uh, necessarily productive of uh, of mental health. Uh, I think that certainly is is uh, you know is a concern. I mean, I it's again. Uh, I think you know, yeah. I think that's you know, it's almost inescapable that the uh, you know does capitalism work at a different um, time cycle than you know human uh, human development? Are we capable of uh, changing our behavior at the same pace that capitalism wants us to? And I'm 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 pretty sure that we aren't. Okay. So, all right. So, we will, this will be, of course, the subject for yet another webinar. Uh, the downside of you know, technology. Um, I have actually a historiographical question. Can you say something about the development of the subdiscipline of history of computers? In effect, when you got started working on this, you know, were you the pioneers in this? Where were you in it? What is the development of the history of this field, which is, of course, itself, you know, changing so rapidly that a lot of new history is piling up for people to deal with? You know, is there a good, how is the professional computer community of historians of computer science and everything to do with it? Yeah, that's a really interesting question that one of the, the pioneers in the field is uh, someone who um, works at the uh, did work at the National Air and Space Museum, Paul Ceruzzi, and he described, be, and so he got interested in, in this field, the history of computing very early on in the, must have been the early 1980s or the late 1970s, and he recounted sort of being mocked by some of his historian colleagues saying, well, do we need then historians of washing machines, or do we need, his, you know, so for, and so, but I think now we understand in some ways that uh, information is different than a lot of, uh, it's not just a machine that in, uh, in information processing is a different field and it has connections more deeply uh, just beyond um, hardware. And so the, the field, the, his, um, the history of technology and its professional organization called the Society for the History of Technology has a, a special interest group and it's called uh, computers, information, and society. And so um, part of it is um, computers, but it's more than that. It's information. And so um, I'm actually, I started out as being um, a historian of uh, electronics. As you mentioned, I, I wrote a book called the, To the Digital Age about the development of semiconductor electronics. And at I teach at North Carolina State University. And uh, next semester, I'm teaching a course called information from Gutenberg to Zuckerberg. And so to look at it in sort of the long durée and looking at how uh, information has always been central to society, that one of the leading um, historians in the United States is a, a professor at uh, Harvard by the name of Robert Darton. And he has made the claim that you know every society is an information society. And so that uh, in every society, we should be thinking about how they handle and process information. And so looking at computing is just one, um, one example of this, but it, um, it really is, I think now seen as fundamental to understanding how any society operates. I will mention, I, I'll just interrupt. I know Dr. Thackeray, I know you're about to speak. There, there's a lady named Anne Blair who does this for early modern Europe, whom I've read. <laughs> Mm -hmm. in my own bed yeah in fact the, the scholarly overload of 1500 exactly. uh, dr thackeray you were i think about to say yeah i was going to say there have been there are and have been many definitions of what is history many statements the one i particularly like is all history is contemporary history which means it's our present concerns and preoccupations that drive us to go to the historical record looking for fresh information. Um, uh, I myself, in the course of my career, uh, when I came into the field of the history of science, um, it was focused on the era from Copernicus to Isaac Newton, because people were puzzling with, oh, gee, what is science? Um, I 
wrote a PhD dissertation that began with Isaac Newton, uh, which was kind of frontier, if you will, in uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, my last serious work was the book on Gordon Moore, because I progressed over time myself to this, um, this present era. And I think um, as our preoccupation shift, we keep going back to the historical record to say, gee, where are we? What can I understand about it? How do we get here? And then the question that uh, you've been asking, what does it imply going forward? And those are perennial human questions. I'll go, go for an even more technical question. How easy is it to get access to the archives of Intel and the other companies? Presumably you need to have access to the business archives and are they actually going to open them to any historian who wants to snoop? Well, it depends how recent and, and so on and so forth. In the particular case of uh, that I'm experienced with, the, you know, uh, Gordon Moore and Intel, uh, it's since he was uh, the central actor over a long time and he had asked me to write the biography, that means that I could get into Intel, but of course they didn't have, didn't have a a massive archive all organized companies tend to operate around destroy it in two years time which <laughs> isn't very helpful yeah so when i wrote my book um so i interviewed G gordon moore and he mentioned that their attorneys uh advised that you know advised intel to destroy documents uh and not you know and not to keep them and so i mean it is uh that was Again, you have this contrast between the large uh, vertically integrated East Coast companies and the Silicon Valley companies. And one of the historical you know, sad points is that these East Coast companies often had large archives. Uh, Bell had uh, Bell Labs and AT&T had a, a very rich archive that was open to researchers, um, RCA a little bit, IBM as well. And so, you know, with the... <laughs> rise of the Silicon Valley companies, it's a lot harder for historians to get inside uh, inside these companies to get access to materials and to even um, continue to write. So, uh, you know, after I finished my book on the MOS transistor, it, for me, didn't seem really possible to continue on because there just weren't archival sources available to do that. So I, I moved to, to another area. Will the archival sources, do you think, you know, show up in a generation, or is it just likely to be something of a blank spot? I'll give you two answers. The one answer is, uh, as Ross is implying, uh, a, a good sign that a company is failing, has reached that stage in its evolutionary life, is when it has a well-organized archive. It's a good sign that that company will fail sometime soon, now, in contrast, I began with work on Isaac Newton, and this is uh, a long time after his death, but his manuscripts survived for centuries in private hands. And it was only uh, in the 1950s that historians actually got to looking at the massive archive that Isaac Newton left behind and that nobody knew existed. So cheer up, maybe they don't destroy everything. <laughs> so, and in my work, I have gotten materials from employees who um, rightly or wrongly, you know, took materials home with them and, and kept them. But I, you know, there is that, I think they would live in fear of, you know, would they be sued if, you know, it was known that they were giving material to someone else? And, you know, obviously a company has much deeper resources, you know, to, uh, you know, pay legal fees and so on than a private citizen does. So, I mean, I lived in a little bit of fear of even using some of these materials because I didn't want to get uh, these, my sources in legal, legal trouble. So I don't know if the, you know, the Isaac Newton example will really hold, uh, you know, today and, you know, if people would keep the same kind of documents and so on. Final footnote, uh, 
you may remember that once upon a time we were about to enter into the paperless society. And, and actually, there's, in Isaac Newton's day, paper was so expensive that Newton, who was the master of the mint, a very rich and influential English figure, wrote on both sides of every sheet, both ways, horizontally, and then you turn the paper around sideways and write the other way, and that way you get your value out of this expensive stuff called paper. <laughs> now, from that era of so little paper, actually a lot survives. What will survive from our era when you can buy, what does a ream of paper cost? I don't know, two dollars, I don't know. And it's a, it's a nice paradox. Thank you. All right, so it's at 325. So I'm going to get us to our closing bits. I will just say, by the way, John Maynard Keynes in his essay as a biography has a wonderful biographical essay on Newton written in the 1940s. So that will give you everyone the state of knowledge of Newton before the, the uh, revolution, which Dr. Thackeray is talking about. What about that essay? Footnote, he used his fortune to buy those manuscripts from private hands and to give them to the University of Cambridge, where they now sit. So, sorry. A good, a good man. All right. I'm going to ask each of you to give a closing statement of, oh, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, something comfortably like that. And when you've done your closing statements, I would then, you know, do a wrap up. Uh, Dr. Thackeray first, if you would. Um, two things. As we have seen and heard, um, history has its limitations as a mode of understanding. But the big but is this. I hate to tell you, the future is unknowable. Unknowable. None of you knows whether the H-bomb will be dropped tonight. You, you, you make a guess, but you don't know. The future is unknowable. The present, of course, is correctly called the specious present because you, you can't, the minute you try to get a hold of it, it's already the past. You can't get the present. So the only thing we've got, folks, like it or not, is history. So please turn around and become historians. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bassett. Sure. I guess, so one thing I, I just think about with the development of Moore's Law is, again, just on this theme of capitalism that Moore's law was made possible by a new form of capitalism. And it ultimately, you could say, played a role in uh, leading to the end of uh, an earlier stage of capitalism, that capitalism, which uh, existed in large uh, East Coast companies, whether it was AT&T, Bell Labs, whether it was RCA or, or IBM. And so uh, there have been a lot of advantages uh, that have come to our society through this new form of capitalism. Uh, but there also have been some costs as well that the um, the uh, pure innovation, pu uh, pure inventions that were made possible at IBM and Bell Labs, for example, are not being funded anymore. And so uh, I guess I just think of both the uh, the costs and the, the profits of this new uh, form of capitalism. All right. Uh, thank you both so much. So let me say thank you to everyone. Thank you to our watchers. Um, we do it for you. We can't do it without you. Your questions you know, were used. They make this happen. Thank you to our panelists, of course. Um, lovely to listen. Lovely to learn. Very grateful. Um, I will just say to everybody in Sundry, uh, one, we are continuing to have webinars, including a last few for the American Innovation Series. Um, I believe we have one on microchips distinct on this on November 28th as our next one, and then the Human Genome on December 12th. And golly, that may actually be it for our American Innovations webinar series. We do lots of other stuff as well. Stay tuned for all that. Uh, we encourage you to join the NAS, particularly if you enjoyed this. You know, we do lots of stuff, not just webinars, but this is part of what we do. Um, I will remind everyone once again that um, 
if you have questions unanswered that you think of later, do not suffer the spirit of the staircase, l'esprit d'escalier. Uh, you can send an email to me, randall at nas.org, r-a-n-d-a-l-l at nas.org. I would be delighted to forward uh, your emails to the professors so they can have the option to answer you. Um, I will say again, this will be up within 24 hours on um, ah, the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel. And I don't know, some pirate channel out of Malaysia or something, take your pick. Ah, humor. Everybody, it's been lovely being on this webinar. Uh, thank you again, all, everyone, so very much. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Arnold. Thank you. Thank you, David.